Hello, this is John Milburn for Laws 11059, Statutory Interpretation, and this is the lecture for Week 7 of Term 3, 2018-2019. Now, I'm pre-recording this lecture. What I have found from previous uh, offerings of the um, summer term is that people are away, find it difficult to attend the live sessions. So this week, Week 7, uh, there is no live Zoom session which we would normally conduct on the um, 2nd of January. So the next live session will be on Wednesday, the 9th of January at 7pm Queensland time. So um, thank you for attending and watching this recorded session. Last week, we dealt with the issue of intrinsic materials, statute components, and we continue the discussion this week by talking about intrinsic materials, the text, and time permitting, I'll digress to uh, discuss some other issues. Next week, in week eight, we'll round off this section by talking about extrinsic materials. A couple of things before I deal with this week's contents. The first is that um, I will um, be returning the results of your first assessment soon, and I thank you for your patience. What I've read so far, I'm um, happy with. I'm happy with the standard of the work. And it seems to me that most people have taken up on some of the clear hints that I've provided in terms of presentation. People are considering and using, for example, my sample document and they're implementing the Australian Guide to Legal Citations, the AGLC, in the content of their work. So thank you very much for that. The um, basic presentation overall is quite good, but if you're struggling in terms of your presentation, please give it some consideration, do some extra catch-up work. Um, you do need to understand the program that you're using to produce the work. For most people, that would be Word and um, there are a lot of very good features, easy to use in the Word program that will help you with your presentation, headings, footnote, um, references, styles, all of those things you need to be well aware of and use. Now, in terms of the content for the assessment, overall, I'm happy with it. Now, of course, there are um, there is a fair degree of subjectivity that one would uh, consider when drawing content or principles from a case. However, it is a very well-known case and most people have identified the major issues. Um, so the um, content from, from some uh, differs a little from others, but still the um, uh, work is overall very good. Now there is a little theme that I want to promote tonight as well, and that is um, trying to apply the principles of statutory interpretation to some degree in a real world context. Now, what do I mean by that? So I'm, I want you to read the material, but be ready to argue at the same time. Not in a negative sense, but in a constructive sense. And of course, lawyers argue all the time. It's our job in the courtroom context to argue a case. And one day we might be arguing a case a certain way, attempting to apply statutes and principles with a certain meaning and application, then the next day we're on the other side and we're arguing the opposite uh, argument. So very fickle lot in that regard. The advantage, of course, that we have in practising law or applying law is that there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer. Now, you might say, well, that's a disadvantage. Um, it is potentially, in terms of the advice that you give to clients, cannot be clear cut, but it's an advantage in terms of presenting assessment work uh, where you can adopt a line, promote that line, argue it well, and uh, still achieve good results. In other words, when dealing with law, reading about the principles, applying the principles of statutory interpretation, you'll be well aware now that there are shades of grey. So you need to look carefully even to see the grey, and you need to be creative and inventive. What you do need to do potentially is pursue an argument uh, based on sound statutory interpretation pr principles. 
Um, so when you're practicing law um, or in, in, the, in this stage, when you're dealing with um, arguments around law, you need to be aware that you um, are really uh, basically trying to argue a presentation um, without necessarily knowing that there's a right or wrong answer. And you can present um, your material in, a, in, a, in a, an effective way, even though uh, it may be contrary to what I'm thinking or what others might think. But some of the basics are very important. Um, people are well aware of this now. Make sure that you do follow the Australian Guide to Legal Citations. Make sure that you have the footnotes, um, including uh, as, uh, as your reference guide. No need for bibliographies. Make sure that you understand how to cite cases correctly. So, for example, the difference between round brackets and square brackets in the context of a case. It's pretty simple. Um, the year is put into round brackets if the case is referred to by way of volume. Otherwise, if it's referred to by way of year, then it'll be in square brackets. And you do need to understand pinpoint referencing. So that is usually citing a, a, a page out of a case. So, for example, if a case starts on page 292 of a particular um, series, then and you're referring to something at 299, then the appropriate reference would be name of the case, year, volume or no volume, then the, um, uh, the reference, for example, CLR, the authorised report, and then the page number where the case starts, followed by comma, the pinpoint reference. One thing you don't do when um, referring to law is to include a URL link to a case. So that doesn't, it's not featured in the um, AGLC. So don't include a UL, URL to Ostley or to Queensland legislation or wherever it is that you've drawn the source material. Cite it in accordance with the AGLC. If you want some adva ex um, examples, have a look in your textbooks and you'll see um, and learn through osmosis some of the um, basic procedures. All right, so you're aware now that law is not black and white. Be wary, therefore, of a simplistic answer. It may be that your particular problem warrants a very simple answer, but usually there's more to it and there's usually the potential to mount contrary or supplementary arguments around a simple problem or what might seem to be a simple problem. So be wary about um, thinking in terms of black and white. Always think about ways that you can be creative and inventive in mounting or pursuing an argument around law and statutory interpretation is something that uh, lends itself to that type of thinking and something that you'll need to implement on a regular basis throughout your studies and career. And then, of course, remember the, the basic distinction between law and equity. Um, and remember that um, when interpreting statutes, we're not necessarily looking at it from a purely technical or um, uh, literal perspective. The black letter law approach, as it were, remember also the intervention of equity and equitable principles. So um, there's some of the things that you want to generally consider. Just quickly a word about collaboration. I do encourage collaboration. The university also encourages collaboration, but if you haven't already dealt with what is collaboration, um, please do some research, ask some questions if you're not sure. Essentially, when you're working with other students, you're allowed to discuss issues that might strike you as um, arising from a particular problem, maybe even um, refer to each other to material that might assist cases, legislation, for example. But what you can't do is cross the line and go into collusion or plagiarism, which would involve things like writing for each other um, or even showing each other your work, the work that you've produced. So collaboration, excellent, but please don't step over the top um, and go beyond that. The other thing that I want you to be consider, to, well, I want you to consider whenever you do an assessment in law, now I'm not just talking statutory interpretation, but anything, <clears throat> um, is 
the ethical issues that arise and the practical practice issues that arise. So I would urge you to always have in mind the possibility of introducing something that deals with ethics in any answer that you write. Now, it may not be possible and it might be just simply too much of a stretch to logically include that type of ethical material in your paper or your presentation or even your exam answer, but always consider it and when necessary, introduce it. Practically, what that might mean is referring to the Legal Profession Act, Queensland, for example, or it might mean referring to the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules or the Barrister's Rules. And you'll find these things are referred to in the um, material that I provide you, the resources that are available. So do have access to those things and ensure you consider them and where appropriate, introduce them into your assessment work. Also, I prepared, um, I, I may well have uploaded, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, a video that features His Honour Judge Dean Moore's own QC. At the time that um, I engaged with His Honour in preparing the video about courtroom ethics, um, His Honour was not appointed. So um, there is reference to, I think, maybe even first names. That would never happen now with His Honour being appointed then it would be in a social context, um, judge, or in a more formal context, uh, your honour, when referring to um, his honour um, now. So um, please consider that video, consider courtroom ethics and ethics generally in answering any legal problem. Um, just on the issue of talking about the bench, remember also the um, value of the bench books for various courts and uh, they're a terrific resource. For those that aren't familiar with bench books, they're, um, um, if you like, a pro forma the judges might consider using when explaining various aspects of the law to a jury. They're particularly relevant in relation to evidentiary issues, and I have the privilege of teaching evidence at this university on a regular basis. But the bench books provide an excellent summary of the law. Of course, they're very authoritative, they're well worth a look and um, they may have a bearing on statutory interpretation issues. So my comment is more general than specifically statutory interpretation, but I do want you to incorporate all of those things we've discussed in your legal thinking and that should then be reflected in your legal problem solving and assessment work. All right, one of the problems with these two camera presentations is you don't get much of a break, I'm sorry. So thank you for um, bearing with me and staying with me. But whenever you're watching a recorded session, I urge you to do two things. The first is be actively listening. Now, what that means is that whilst you can listen to this while you're jogging or in the car driving, you really do need to um, work hard at actively listening. And by that I mean, for example, if we refer to a case or piece of legislation or a website, you really need to be at your computer and access this material and uh, incorporate it into your notes as you go. So listen to it by all means while you're um, uh, preparing a meal, but make sure you go back and uh, go through a second time uh, in a more active way. Uh, the other thing is that when you're dealing with these um, pre-recorded sessions, you should be prepared to stop and think about how that might be relevant to an assignment or something else that you're doing um, at, a, at a particular time. All right, so by now all of you know about, um, about Project Blue Sky against the ABA. And a central proposition we draw from that case is that a court construing a statutory provision must strive to give meaning to every word of the provision, and that was Brendan uh, CJ. So ordinarily, the meaning is the ordinary meaning. I guess that makes sense. But different words have different meanings depending on the context, and that particularly applies to law. So in your textbook, there's reference to the word made, M-A-D-E. Um, let's look at a, 
a practical example. So I want you to place yourself in a situation where you are now an advisor. A client comes to you and says the following. I want some compensation for injuries I sustained. I tried to get something out of my bag on an overhead rack whilst on a bus tour. I was injured. And the insurance company will not pay because they say the personal injuries insurance policy only applies when the person was wearing a seatbelt. On that basis, the insurance company has rejected my claim. They say, because I was reaching up to grab something out of the overhead rack, I was not therefore wearing a seatbelt. So the question is, can I claim? Now, if you've done your reading, you'll be aware that the real case around that issue is Insight Vacations, PDYLTD, Trading as Insight Vacations and Young, 2011 243 CLR 149. And just as an aside, before we go further, note the difference between a company and a business name. Insight Vacations PDYL today is a company that is a legal entity and it was trading as Insight Vacations, which is a business name. Business name is not a legal entity, although a legal entity may use the business name for the purpose of suing or being sued. Anyway, um, that's an aside. So this case of Insight Vacations was a High Court decision. We know that because the reference is CLR, which is the authorised report series for the High Court. And the High Court referred to the fact that ordinarily, passengers do not have to be seated 100% of the time. That makes sense. Um, it would be very messy business indeed on a long haul flight if that was not the case. Therefore, even though the exemption clause contained words with an ordinary and clear meaning, the ordinary meaning, says the High Court, is the meaning of the words in the ordinary situation to which they refer. Now, of course, because people on a bus sometimes do get out of their seat, to go to the toilet, to get something out of the overhead rack, to speak to someone, someone else, to tend to child, for example. That means that the exemption clause must be read according to its ordinary meaning. And that means that even though the clause says something to the effect that um, passengers must be wearing their seatbelt, it only... Um, and the insurance company uh, says it only applies if the course, if the person is, is belted, the exemption, says the High Court, only applies if the passenger is also seated. So it read into that the fact that if the person is seated, then they must be wearing their seatbelt in order to apply. Let's look at that and consider it, because your head might be spinning a little bit if you think about this logically. What it means is that even though the clause says the insurance policy applies only if the person is belted, as in seatbelt, that exemption only applies if the passenger is also seated. The court was willing, therefore, to add something to the policy that did not otherwise exist. Place yourself in the situation of being the advisor as I introduce this section. What would you have said to the client where clearly the insurance policy said you may claim on the insurance if you are wearing a seatbelt and that's, what, that's all it said? So how do you advise parties in these circumstances? It's all very well to know the case and know the decision and then think, yeah, that makes sense. But what I'm asking you to do is for a moment go back in time to a situation where the client came to you and said, can I pursue the insurance company in these circumstances? Implicitly, will the court read into the insurance clause this extra provision to say, that is, it only applies while I'm seated, not otherwise. So put yourself in the position of the advisor. You say to the client, yes, the terms are clear. There is an exemption to say that you cannot claim if you're not wearing a seatbelt. That's what the clause says. But says the advisor, 
I think if we go to court, we can ask the court to include an exemption, that is unwritten exemption, into that situation. Would you be brave enough to do that? Would you be brave enough to go to the High Court with all the huge expense associated with doing so and argue the toss and argue that position? I come back to the starting point of what I mentioned this evening, and that is you need to look at the words but be brave, creative and inventive. Would you be willing to do that in those circumstances and go to the High Court? So the lawyers, the team behind the plaintiff in that circumstance took on the case and did an excellent job, of course, in arguing um, successfully, as it turns out, that the High Court would be willing to add in those um, additional requirements that weren't part of the clause. So when you're doing your, when you're undertaking your reading, I want you to always think about what you would do if you are in that situation at the start without necessarily knowing at the time what the end result would be. The next issue is that a technical or legal meaning may be used. There is a presumption here and it's in favour of a trade meaning in revenue statements. Have a look at Collector of Customs against Agfa Gavert Limited, 1996, 186 CLR 389. In that case, the company could import photographic paper without paying duty if it had to use a silver dye bleach reversal process. So the court interpreted the phrase in a hybrid manner. The court held that the term silver dye bleach had a technical meaning, in other words, a trade meaning. But the court held that the entire phrase did not have a technical or trade meaning. So the court held that part of the phrase that had a technical trade meaning would be read subject to that meaning and the balance would be read in accordance with its ordinary meaning. Just stop there and think about that. Think about that from the position of you being an advisor from the outset in trying to interpret that clause and anticipating what the court might say. Picture yourself sitting opposite a client and saying, well, I think what the court will do is read part of the phrase in its trade meaning and will read the balance of the phrase in its ordinary meaning. Will the court understand what you're talking about? And more importantly, would you be willing to litigate based on what you believe the court would do? And would you then go to the High Court with that argument? So you can see that in order to practice law and to um, make these arguments, you need to be brave, have a brave and well-resourced client, and also be inventive and creative. Let's talk about current meaning. Refer to Sanson, your text at page 147. There's a quote, <clears throat> and Michelle Sanson says, the meaning given to words in a statute is the modern meaning, not the meaning of the words at the time the statute was enacted. Unless, of course, the act specifies otherwise or it is obvious from the context that it was intended so. Now, this is an approach which suggests that an act is always speaking. Always speaking. So you'll hear that term quite often. Let's consider a case. It's referred to in your text, and that is the decision of Justice Kirby in Coleman against Power. It's an important decision. 2004 220 CLR1 at 245. And you'll see the quotation in your textbook. Now, I'm just going to paraphrase that um, quotation. The purposive test is objective and it is derived from the living language of the law as read today. It is not derived from the subjective intentions of parliamentarians held decades earlier if such intentions 
could ever be accurately ascertained. So what was the discussion then that we had about the intention of Parliament and how do those words of Coleman and Power and the comments made by Michelle Sanson fit comfortably with that test relating to the objective of Parliament when creating legislation? Why bother then looking at second reading speeches and explanatory notes or memorandums? Why did we discuss the mischief rule? Um, why consider the intention of Parliament in enacting a law as being relevant? So is Justice Kirby telling us that it was all wrong? Or is Justice Kirby telling us that the purposive test is different from the mischief rule when a lengthy delay, when there's a lengthy delay between considering a matter and the original enacting, enacting of the law uh, as was present in Coleman and Power? And I think it's that. So let's look at it that way. So the length of time, I think, between the making of the law and the interpretation of the particular provision, I think is an important factor. And that's something that we can draw from Coleman and Power. Let's move on to another topic, and that is consistent meaning. This is really important. And you'll see it in your text at page 149. Where different words are used in a place where the same word could have been used, the reader is entitled to assume that the writer intended a different meaning. Otherwise, the writer would have used the same word. So here's where you need to be very careful when you're drafting and have the pleasure and privilege of, of taking advanced statutory interpretation and drafting a little plug for another elective course down the track, which is a really good, really good unit. At least I have um, taken that unit. Um, so think about what you are doing when you draft a document and think about what you're doing when you're attacking the drafting of an opponent's document. When you're drafting a document, be consistent. If you use the word contract, to reflect an agreement between the parties, would you then use the word agreement as a later time to explain the same thing? Or would you use the term deed to explain the same thing? Or would you remain absolutely consistent in referring to this agreement as contract all the way through the document? If you're attacking the drafting of a document of an opponent, you would look for these differences um, in words to suggest that there must have been an in, a different meaning intended if that's something that works to the benefit of your client. From a practical perspective right now, be aware that when I'm reading your assessment work, and I'm sure that other unit coordinators are the same, I'm also looking for that consistent usage of language. So it's not just consistency in terms of presentation, it's consistency in terms of content that is important for you when writing your assessment or examination work. Now, it can become a little repetitive and you might like to exercise some drafting techniques to assist in that regard. So if, for example, you know that uh, you are likely to refer to the Acts Interpretation Act 1901 Commonwealth on a number of occasions throughout a particular assignment or piece of assessment. What you can do is a very simple drafting technique. After you've written the full text of the statute on the first occasion, you simply put in brackets AIA. Um, if, you may, if you wish to distinguish that from the Queensland legislation, you might vary that by AIA and the year or AIA CTH, for example close the bracket. You don't need, please do not put in here and after referred to as the AIA in inverted commas, close brackets. That's a technique we all used in the 80s. 
and none of us use it now. It's completely gone. It's um, completely contrary to the plain English, plain language um, uh, movement. So don't do that. Um, sometimes people put it in brackets and inverted commas. To me, that's superfluous. The brackets are just fine. That's all you need. Anyway, uh, just an aside. So the point there is that um, be consistent with your drafting and be mindful of drafting techniques that might assist you in terms of an economy and uh, avoiding repetition. Let's move on to the next section and that is limiting words. When Parliament uses words such as solely, exclusively or only, do they mean something different to primarily? Is it possible that solely, exclusively and only means to the exclusion of all else? Most of the time or does it depend on the circumstances? Let's consider exercise 7.3 from your text. This was the decision of Ride Municipal Council against Macquarie University. 1978-139, CLR 633. So what happened in that case? The university land is exempt from the payment of land taxes if used or occupied, note the word used or occupied, by the university solely for the purposes thereof. Leaving aside that we'd rather not draft using thereof, you get the idea. So some, some questions that arise as a result of that, aren't there? The first one is, are the words used or occupied words to be read that are synonyms? And the second is, does solely mean 100%? So the university, so the wording again, <clears throat> exempt from payment of land tax, if used or occupied by the university solely for the purposes thereof. So what happened in this case is the university leased some of its land to commercial outlets. You'll see that often at universities, there'll be coffee shops, and might be a post office, there might be a stationary outlet or a bookshop or some sort of commercial outlet. So this is what happened in this case. And the court said that in doing so, the university was still using the land for the purposes of the university, even though the contrary argument from the revenue authorities was that in leasing it out, it was not using it for the purposes of the university. Hendias, Hendiasis, Hendiatus, sorry, Hendiatus. Um, my apologies for stumbling over that word. So <clears throat> what are these things? Hendiasis, hendiasis is an example of or words that are used together that have a single meaning. Examples, cease and desist, good and ready, sick and tired. They're really composite phrases, aren't they? But you read them together. So let's consider a case referred to in your text. Victims Compensation Fund Corporation against Brown, 2003, 2001, um, sorry, two th uh, 2003, ALR 260. The High Court considered the expression symptoms and disability. And the question is, was this hendiasis? And the court found it was not a composite expression, meaning that it had one meaning. The words should be read disjunctively, meaning that they both operated independently. The reason I raise that is that it might be something you can use to support an argument against or for a certain interpretation that you believe is relevant. So whenever you see the word and, think about imposing or arguing that type of argument. The next issue relates to temporal expressions. And the case in the text which is one that I used for assessment purposes last year or the year before, was Jemina Gas Networks, New South Wales Limited, against Mine Subsistence Board, 
2001 HCA 19. You'll see that I've given you the High Court Reporting Service reference rather than the CLR reference. But what happened in Jemina? Claims for compensation can be made for expenses incurred or proposed in preventing or mitigating damage the owner could reasonably have anticipated would otherwise have arisen from a subsistence that has taken place. That was the wording around which all of these arguments occurred. A couple of things there. It's a long sentence. And I've said on many occasions, and I'm, I'm sure you're tired of me saying this, where possible use short sentences, you're less likely to get you, fall into error or find that the sentence becomes internally inconsistent. This is an excellent example because I'm going to read that same paragraph but this time, I'm going to add in some des description that relates to temporal issues, temporal meaning time. So, listening carefully, claims for compensation can be made for expenses incurred, that's past, or proposed, that's future, in preventing, well, that's future, or mitigating, that's present, damage the owner could reasonably have anticipated would otherwise have arisen, future, from a subsistence that has taken place, that's past. So you can see that there is a complete jumble of temporal expressions within the same sentence, which means, of course, that lawyers have to become involved in interpreting it, and ultimately, in this case, it went to the High Court. And the High Court was not able to come to a unanimous decision. It's yet another example of where the decisions um, of the learned um, judges were, uh, the conclusions were different based on the same reading. So even in the High Court, we have majority and um, we have dissenting judges. In fact, it's quite common. The majority concluded that while there were linguistic difficulties, in all possible constructions. Ultimately, they preferred the purpose of the provision as the prevention and reduction of damage before it was caused. They considered the purpose of the provision as the prevention and reduction of damage before it was caused. Justice Bell was of the view that the ordinary grammatical meaning of the provision confined claims to improvements after subsistence had occurred but before damage had resulted. That is, from a subsistence that has taken place probably meant that the subsistence has taken place. Does that make sense? So, Jemina is an interesting case and also it's a lesson on how to draft effectively. Simplicity, as always, is the key. Now the next topic relates to intrinsic materials that are inconsistent or in conflict with one another. Again, we go back to Project Blue Sky. So what happened in Project Blue Sky? Well, Project Blue Sky challenged the Australian standard that was created by the Australian Broadcasting Authority. So I guess you're familiar with what we mean by standards. So the ABA said 55% of all programs broadcast in peak times need to be Australian programs. And the PBS alleged that the standard was inconsistent with Section 160 of the Broadcasting Services Act 1992 Commonwealth. What did that um, mean? Well, it, that section obliged Australia to comply with any convention to which it's a party. And the specific convention referred to in that case was the Australian-New Zealand Closer Economic Relations Trade Agreement, which was a bilateral free trade agreement. The New Zealand service providers, such as film and television companies, should enjoy no less favourable treatment and access than Australian film and television companies, 
according to that section. So the question was for the High Court, how do we reconcile this obvious dis difference and obvious inconsistency? Something has to be dominant and something has to be subordinate. The High Court concluded that was the case and said that Section 160 of the Act was the dominant provision and Section 122 of the Act, which provided the basis upon which the ABA could make the standard, was the subordinate provision. In other words, that which could be done by the ABA within the context of Section 122 power has to be subject to and work within the constraints imposed by Parliament in the Section 160 overriding provision. I hope all that makes sense. And I'm sure it all does, those of you who have completed the assessment task. So when faced with provisions within the same Act or within different Acts that appear to be inconsistent or in conflict, the Court must identify which provision Parliament intended to be dominant and which provision or provisions were intended to be subordinate. I guess it would be useful from a drafting perspective, and again, advanced statutory interpretation and drafting deals with these sorts of issues, um, to actually say, this is what we intend to be dominant, this is what we intend to be subordinate, then we wouldn't have to worry about going to the High Court to give answers to these problems. But in fairness, Parliament has a lot of work to do and it can't always anticipate each of these problems. Um, so when faced with provision, the courts must identify what's dominant, what's subordinate. That's part of what we take from Project Blue Sky. There's many things to take from Project Blue Sky, but that's part of it. And the court does this by examining the purpose of the Act. So again, emphasising the purposive approach, the overall context, the contextual approach, which was from the um, Bankstown case, including the intrinsic content, which is the statute as a whole, and then, of course, the extrinsic contact, context, which is historical, political, social, um, and international. So that's where I propose to leave it today. Thank you very much for attending. I'm sorry that it's difficult when it's just me, as I mentioned earlier, but I do appreciate, appreciate your um, uh, listening to this presentation. So where do we go from here? Well, as I mentioned, there's no live session on Wednesday the 2nd of January. But on Wednesday the 9th of January at 7pm Queensland time, we will continue our sessions. And at that stage, we'll be dealing with week eight material, which is extrinsic materials. Please keep up with your reading, read ahead where you can. And at the same time, I want you to um, bear in mind the requirement to complete the second assessment task, which is due on the 10th of January 2019 at 11.45 p.m. Bear in mind on this occasion, there is, a, and as is the case for almost all of my assessment work, there is a cutoff. The cutoff is Saturday the 19th of January 2019 at 11.45 p.m. After that, I won't accept any submissions. It's worth 20%, so it's worth doing well. And it's important because the, the way in which you go about your work for the second assessment will help you enormously when it comes to the take home paper, the third assessment released on the 7th of February. I do want you now to start working in earnest on answering the question that I set last year for statutory interpretation take home paper. Um, and uh, you should be able to understand and answer those sorts of questions. Bear in mind that those students only had a window of, I think, three hours to complete the task. So you've got so much more time. You've got 29 hours to complete the task. So I, I may have to make the question a bit harder than it was last year. But you should at least be able to answer all of those questions um, in quick time. And if you're struggling, Please ask for some questions and we can talk about that in class at a later time. Again, thank you for listening. All the best. Enjoy your festive season and we'll see you um, on the 9th of January. All the best.